start this session, I'm going to be bringing up stage Mr. Tom Ayo. David, please put your hands together for Mr. Tom Ayo David as he comes to give a very short, you know, uh, a session on an already listed topic. So if you have your brochures with you, you can go to page five. You will see his name and you will see uh, what he will be speaking on briefly just to give us some, you know, knowledge about uh, what this is. So, um, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope we're having a, a very nice time. Yeah, so I'm going to be speaking very briefly uh, on uh, the topics around uh, project management and business analysis. And uh, I'll be very brief at it. And uh, what I'm speaking to is uh, going to be around how you can delve into these uh, subject matters and uh, how you can uh, use it to benefit uh, your job opportunity search and uh, how you can progress in it. So, uh, we'll see that, uh, apologies, I don't have any slides uh, that I'm going to be projecting, but I'm going to ensure to carry you along. Um, the topic of project management is a very interesting one. Uh, let me give you a little background of, about myself and how I came into this, uh, into this uh, subject matter. So I, I read microbiology, uh, first degree, and uh, I started working in a bank after I, I graduated and uh, all of a sudden it wasn't just making sense to me, I, I wanted something different. And uh, that was how I just decided one day I was going to go into, uh, I was going to take a course on project management and uh, I did Prince 2. I, I mean, I got a good opportunity to work uh, in, uh, in the oil and gas and uh, in upstream oil and, oil and gas and actually that's where I'm at at the, at, at the moment. But the experience that I got in project management and uh, business analysis are very unique. And this is why I'm tying the two together. If you are a good, pro if you are a project manager, you would be a good business analyst. And this is where I want to tie it together. So you know, project management it's very uh, it's very common. You have a skill of managing projects from end to end, start to finish, from administration, the plan, you implement, and you end. That's how the overarching uh, thing about project management is. But because we are in the era of products, right? Uh, you heard the speakers talking about building. What are they building? So you wonder, what are they building? It's products. And most of these products are tech products. IT, software. Uh, in fact, I was, I was discussing with some of my colleagues uh, and I said, if you are building anything and you want funding for it, nobody will take you serious if it's not tech enabled. So that's where we find ourselves. Nobody, no, no, I don't know, Dr. Akin, uh, am I right? Is, any, is anybody that is willing to fund any initiative that is not tech enabled? I mean, it's, uh, when you raise funds, like you raise seeds for, 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 for your visions or for your, for your products, if it's not tech enabled, nobody's really interested. No matter how bad it is. So now, I'm trying to tie something around uh, each other. Uh, for you so that you can understand. So, if you, like I said, if you're a project manager, right, you are automatically a business analyst. And this is where it gets funny. Now, having all the skills of managing projects at a point when you transition into product will be somewhat irrelevant if you don't have a business analyst skill. And who is a business analyst? That's what I'm going to anchor it. Uh, so a business analyst is that link, you know, the person that ties a customer and ties them to the development team. You, you have one side a business owner who has an idea and you have the team that can build upon this idea. Now, those people are speaking different languages. You cannot expect someone like Dan Gote right now to communicate directly with software engineers. He may not understand him, he may not understand them, right? That's why you need that person that can bridge that gap. And that person is a business analyst. 
And it is better if that business analyst is a project manager as well. So I sit in that position, right? I've been on projects where we are talking finance, right? Because when you start a project from the beginning, what people that are investing in it want to hear is the finance. They want to hear if the project is viable. Should I invest? Should I not invest? That's a decision. So how do you help them if you don't understand anything about finance, right? So I said that to emphasize on the fact that having these skills will set you apart, right? Having the skills of project management, business analysis will set you apart. Unfortunately, that is the core of what Learn with Pride does, right? That's the core. So apart from the fact that, you know, it's a tech uh, industry uh, that trains people in a lot of uh, areas, the focus is on project management and business analysis. Now, let, now let, me, let me summarize and uh, finish my, you know, my monologue to say that the skill of a project manager, right, is relevant in the industry we are today. And some of you will wonder, project manager, how do I become a project manager? You can do that in a lot of ways. You can take courses, uh, you can self-study, you can get certified. And if you don't even want to go that route, right, you can learn it by experience. Your life is a project. I used to teach, when I teach my students, I used to tell them simple things as you renovating your room. That's a project. Anything that costs you time and that you have a plan and you have a uh, okay, time and you have a cost. Yes, you have a time, you have cost and you have a plan. It's already a project. So you coming to this event today, it's a project because one way or the other, you have committed here, you are going to spend time, and you have planned your schedule. Maybe you cancelled something before you came in. That's a project. So it is the time for us to be consciously aware that project management is a key and essential part of the industry we are today. If you don't, if you look into the, uh, into the employment, if you look into the employment uh, scope around Nigeria, you find out that a lot of employers are interested in people that can manage projects. Even if you are working in the bank, if you are working in any sector, people are interested in people that have these skills. And having these skills tie it to uh, the finances and the analysis is something that will set you apart. Alright, so even though uh, I have limited time, what I would say is, if we have the opportunity, you know, to uh, to upskill, I would advise you uh, to go in the direction of learning about project management, business analysis, and sorry, to finally cap and uh, drop the mic. When I say project management, a lot of us think about the uh, the waterfall, what I call the traditional method. No, that is not. I'm talking about entirety of both Agile and the Waterfall. Yeah. So, and if you go into Agile, we have a lot of methodologies that uh, Agile applies in managing projects. I, I hope that we'll have more opportunities to discuss about this or have questions which I'll be willing to answer. But let me just drop it here and uh, give back the mic to the anchor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Toro. I hope David. Now, we are going to present some awards. Uh, if you've read you know, the agenda, you see that we have some awards to present. Um, to present this award, I'm going to be introducing the visioner, Mr. Oladeji Ake on stage. Please put your hands together for Mr. Oladeji Ake as he comes on stage. He will be you know, helping us present the awards to some of our awardees. First and foremost, to start with, please put your hands together for Dr. Akin on Nosoya. You know, that effect it has when they are, you know, throwing confetti and there's noise and we're shouting. Yeah. Please put your hands together for Dr. Akin on Nosoya. Uh -huh. 
the next person to come up stage uh whilst we wait for that award uh to be delivered later on is Inkeruka Michelle, could you put your hands together for Inkeruka Michelle as she come uh, to deliver a very short, you know, uh, presentation? Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, as I said, my name is Inkeruka. I'm a practicing product slash project manager for about, and I've been practicing for about five to six years now. Um, currently, I am the growth product manager for Pair Money. It's a fintech that um, works with small businesses. But I don't want to delve too much into that. Um, as you can look at your brochure, it tells you what I'm supposed to talk about today, which is bridging excellence in product and project management. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delve into some of those key tools I use or techniques I use that has helped me stay in this field for so long, practicing, and of course, making key career moves. Um, one of the key things or tools I tend to lean into when it comes to bridging excellence is I always try to ensure that there is clarity in my scope as well as alignment in our different goals and objectives. As a product slash project manager, it's important that you remember that even though you're de developing solutions for problems that your company might be facing, try not to deviate from what your organization has prepared for themselves goal-wise, vision-wise, plan-wise. Ensure that the solution you're coming up with aligns with whatever it is that your organization is currently trying to push. Also, it is not, no need for saying it, but generally you should note that whatever you're producing has to go through enough testing because a key point for you is the quality of your work. There's nothing more embarrassing than doing a push that supposedly goes live and it has so many issues that you have to take it back. So test, 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 test. Test like a mad person. Have yourself test, have strangers test, have people that don't even know anything test. It's very important because that way, even issues that you never thought might be issues might end up being a stumbling block to your successful launch. So keep on testing keep on tweaking, keep on touching. Now, we're not saying that you will not now push because you're testing for all the situations, but test till you're about 90% sure in your product before it goes into the market. The next thing you should do is user experience satisfaction. A key thing that gets lost in the source when there's conversation about, oh, trying to develop a product. Um, I think someone talked about it before, was trying to please investors. But you have to go beyond trying to please investors. You have to first understand who is your target market and how do you, this solution was for them. You found a problem that they were facing and you came up with a solution that will satisfy them. Correct. So how do you go about ensuring that this thing that you have created actually satisfies their need? Do you just throw it out there and if they like it or not, you move on? Or do you ensure that they are actually satisfied? Do you get feedback? How do you take and process that feedback? It's very important because sometimes it might even be the feedback that you get that would motivate a new feature in your product. Remember, product creation is a continuous process. It doesn't just say, oh, I've created this and I'm never going to improve on it. Your day-to-day -day apps is always telling you to update. That's them improving on the app. Another thing you need to do is you're a leader. You're supposed to foster collaboration. Ensure that everybody is not working just on their own as an island. Ensure that there is communication. Take advantage of your meetings. Take advantage of calls. Do not make yourself an unapproachable person because it is their ability to approach you that helps them be synergy within your team. So let there be an air of collaboration. Do not be a tyrant. Do not be a terrorist. Be democratic in nature take their feedback and actually make use of the feedback that they share or give to you. Another key thing, as I just said as well, don't be rigid. We hear agile project management, I hear, oh, that means, okay, tweak and twist things, but even ask yourself as a project manager or a product manager, remember that you can't be rigid when it comes to developing something. You might be wanting to launch a product that requires physical presence and a pandemic occurs. You do not now say, oh, by all means necessary, I have to still launch this thing, knowing that nobody physically can show up. 
So you pivot. It doesn't now mean, oh, because the pandemic has occurred, you now bury what you spend money on. You pivot, you adjust, you make changes to improve on your product. So you are still able to hit your market launch time, or even if you're delayed at maximum under a month, you're able to still hit that market launch time that is set for yourself. And then you make use of your tools and know your industry. You are, as a product and project manager, supposed to constantly be aware of what is happening in your industry, especially in an economy like Nigeria, where laws just sometimes pop out unaware. You're supposed to be in line and track trend analysis within your industry so it doesn't shock you or take you unaware when it comes. We saw what happened with Gokada, their full investment in the bikes, and then what happened? It got shut down. There was no way to walk around it. So what did they do? They pivoted to the delivery model. As someone that is in that field, it falls on you because you are technically the CEO of the company. Not the company, but the CEO of the product. So it falls on you to see these thoughts coming and begin to look for ways to pivot so your business is in, well, in flux. Lastly, all I would just like to use to end my section is, as a product that project manager, although it has like a big title, it's very important that you remember that you are a servant to all and you are a master of none. You don't own anybody. You can't force people to do work. They will do the work. So it falls on you knowing that this is a tough field and in the end, it is your responsibility to ensure that the product comes out on time to deal in motivation, to deal in emotional intelligence with how you handle people. Remember that you cannot directly control people's outputs. All you can do is make suggestions. So tap into your emotional intelligence, take up soft skills, learn patience. If your developers are getting on your nerves, take a break, go and breathe, go and drink water, and come back and beg them. Because if they say they will not work, they will not work. There's nothing you can do. So you take a breath, calm yourself down, and you ask yourself what exactly are the issues that is preventing them from working. And you listen. It might be stupid. It might be ridiculous. You listen. You let them know that you are listening. And then you respond with maturity. As a product manager, there's no effort in being immature. There's no effort being childish. There's no effort being easily offended. If you are easily offended, you would hate this field because so many things can offend you in a day. But it's your ability to calm down, take a breath, and know that it is not a personal affront at your person, but it might just be something else that is going on in their life. So how do you take, yes, you will play the role of a HR. How do you mend their feelings to get back to do the work that you need them to do? But yeah, I guess that's everything I have to say. Um, I do the project slash product management cohort for Learn with Pride. So if you want to get to hear more from me, you can possibly sign up and get to know me more. Thank you guys. We have a second award uh, that will be going out and uh, I'm going to call uh, someone else to present that award for us. Um, we'll be bringing um, Oluwata your Winkule to the stage for our award, to receive our award, and then we'll be bringing Atkin the Visionary to the stage as well. I've been forced to say a word, but yeah, I think um, you know, a tree you know, cannot make a forest. We can have this vision you know, to achieve a certain thing, but if we don't have the like-minded people to support the vision, All right, so um, we'll be having a general session now, um, and our facilitator is Itwen Iyenne. I hope I pronounced that right. Okay, my name is Itwen Itwen. Okay, so uh, I'm going to sing uh, just a few points about um, data and analysis. Well, um, for every business, 
that wants to um, optimize their operations, um, want to improve their processes, and um, also, also want to um, improve um, their return on investments. Um, there's a need to engage the role of a data analyst. And the role of a data analyst involves uncovering hidden patterns in the data that is generated by any organization and providing actionable insights that the organization used to make decisions that will impact positively on the business. So now the role of the data analyst cannot be overemphasized for a small, big business that hopes to improve their processes and hopes to um, expand their operation. So um, there are a couple of things um, as a data analyst that you have to put into consideration when um, you're handling your data. Now, one of the key things you have to understand is that you're not a domain expert. Now, you need to work with the um, stakeholders to have proper understanding of the environment that you are working. All right, not just you having, um, not just you being proficient in the usage of a tool, the business intelligence tools and other tools that are available, but a combination of your business knowledge and the skill that you already have will make you very effective when um, carrying out analysis, all right? So um, business, sorry, um, data analysis is 70% data training. For everyone who has been in the industry, you already understand that you can analyze the wrong data and expect to come out with a good recommendation. If your data is corrupted, your recommendation will equally be corrupted and it impacts on the business. Alright, so you have to ensure that the data you're working with is correct. Your 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 correct data in the right format, the data is correct before you proceed with your analysis. Alright? So after ensuring that your data is correct and you've carried out your analysis. You also have to be able to communicate your analysis in a format that is implementable. You can have the best um, chat, you can have the best analysis box. You also have to understand the knowledge base of the people that you're provisioning this report for. I'm talking about non-technical staff or non-technical so you also have to put them in consideration, try to see things from their perspective. So when you're communicating, communication is equally important. So when you're communicating your findings to them, you also have to be able to communicate it in a format that is implementable, all right? Because most of the people you have to deal with sometimes may not be that technical. So you don't start using all those big technical terms to communicate your findings. Yes, you can use chat, but at the same time, provide context to your chat such that they are able to understand the, the, the information that you're passing across, all right? So um, those are the few things that I just want to touch on. I said um, understanding domain knowledge, ensuring that your data is correct, and also communicating your findings in a format that is easily understood and implementable. So, on learn with pride, there's a lot to learn, all right? Data analysis is a very interesting field. There's a lot to learn. There are a lot of tools that are available which you can use to analyze your data. So, I, I would like to use this opportunity to encourage every one of you that is interested in becoming a data analyst to take advantage of this platform. As a data analyst, you are a solution provider, all right? There's so much joy you derive as a data analyst that you've provided a recommendation.
recommendation to a business and it was implemented and the business expanded or there's a huge improvement in the, in the, in the performance of the business. So, so I encourage every one of you that is interested in coming on board as a data analyst, um, is interested in becoming a data analyst to take advantage of the platform. There's a lot to learn. There is so much to learn as a data analyst, not just to the business, but you can also apply the skill that you've learned to your personal life. All right. Thank you so much, and I look forward to having all of you that seeks to use this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, finally, uh, I'm going to call on Abdulaziz Lukman. Please put your hands together for him as he comes on stage. Uh, he will take us briefly, and then we'll move to our next uh, topic. Thank you. Good afternoon. You agree with me that having a good product is not as important as having a good marketing. Well, good afternoon. My name is Lukman Aziz. I'm a CV slash resume coach, and I will be taking us through the process of marketing ourselves. You all will agree with me that everyone is a product. Of course, if I ask you, where did you graduate from? You say, I'm a, I'm a product of the University of Lagos. That makes you a product. So you need to understand the strategy, the heart of positioning yourself for opportunities out there. So after learning the skills and having a tone of accomplishment in your chosen field, you need to learn how to present yourself, how to, how to market yourself so that you can attract the, the opportunities you need. And doing this, there are several ways to give out it. Basic, basically today I'll be taking us quickly through through the strategy of an effective CV resume, we talk briefly about LinkedIn and we close it with between to interview and portfolio for the professional. So let's get into it. The first thing is to understand what matters, what what really interests someone in your CV. Even these days, when merely interacting with someone virtually. I want to know about you, but I don't have the time to be asking you how that you want to do it yesterday. I can just ask you, can I see your CV? So whatever it is, the world is going. For a very long time, CVs is going to be a topic that we need to pay attention to. But then, what are, what are the key things that we that determines how effective our CVs are? And I will not be, I'm not going to be answering this question. I'm, I'm going to be answering from the perspective of a, a job opening that you intended applying for. After the first thing you see, they might, they might say, okay, data analysis has learned with pride limited. So they tell you, learn with pride is a new learning company, brief introduction about the company. The next thing they go into is about the role. They tell you, the data analysis has learned with pride, we do this, we do that, we do this. Then the next thing you have is the job description. In bullet, it's most times it's used to be in bullet points if they have enough time and they're very serious about it. You can have five to seven bullet points of things you are going to be doing on a daily basis. The next thing you have is the job specification. That is when they will tell you BSc and economies or relevant courses, two years experience in the startup or high growth organization, uh, international and communication skills. They might name one or two software proficiency in. Uh, B I W, you can have that as well. And those are uh, uh, the things that you, that you need to have on your CV. So how do you now take what they have on the job description to be on your CV? That is when we come to the aspect of the essential component of the CV. The first essential part of the CV that we all know, we might not have acknowledged it, is the experience session. Because the first thing, a lot of graduates that are just coming to the market, those days we used to have a problem of uh, the axis for experience that don't have it. They won't, at the point, they won't even ask what did you study in school. How many years experience you have? What have you done before? And that is why sometimes it is usually very good to leverage every opportunity to, to do something that can happen. The next important thing is our skill sets. And the third one is education. 
Let me take us into each and every. One thing I need to say before going forward is that CVs are written for two, two categories, like two, it is written to two people. The human resource professional and the both. The both in form of the ATS. Most of the CVs out there did not even get to the end of the recruiter before it, it ended up being trashed by the ATS. And that is when that is when you have to take cognizance of the father. In as much as you are having in mind that a HR person is going to review your CV, you need to impress them. You need to first understand that it cannot land in the hand of a, a recruiter without it being scanned by ATS. And that is where the strategy comes in. So, the, f the first thing you have in their CV, sorry, I don't have this title. So, the first thing we have in the CV is the basic information. That have your name at the top, your address, your phone number, email address, and LinkedIn URL, and portfolio, and other things that are just going to be the caption, like the introduction to your personality. The thing about this that most people know is the fact that even if they said the role is removed, for most of the removed job, you are going to see it, for a lot of them, you are going to see it removed. Sorry, they are going to write Lagos in brackets, remote. They are, they are telling you that this person is going to work remotely, or it is for someone in Lagos. And one of those things we don't pay attention to is that ATS go as far back as checking the location of these people. Outside Nigeria, in places like United States of America, where states are states, the couple, the states have very strong power. There are some companies that cannot pay you when you are a resident of a particular state. So they need you to be residing in a state where they can employ. So if you are now outside the state, uh, outside that specific state, and they said they want a remote person from this location, but you are not there, definitely, you can see that is, that is the smallest part of it, the location where you are. So if you are applying for a job in a particular location, it is always good to have your CV domiciled, like your address domiciled in the same location. That is a simple, that is very, it is a very simple thing, but a lot of people have missed out on opportunity because of it, despite how small it is. The next thing we have is the summary, after these basic details. The next thing we have is summary, but I'm not going to be talking about that yet. Because the summary majorly is something that doesn't work for, it is not targeted at attracting the human recruiter. It is targeted at meeting some of the Condition set in the boots. A lot of I know some people here who know SEO very well. When it comes to CV and ATS, SEO is something you need to understand and master. Let's go into the important part: the the work experience. The thing is, learning to tell your story very well, like learning to tell your story in a very attractive manner, is the, is the key of any good CV. But in the process of telling it in a very attractive manner, you have to keep it short. Because if I have over 100, and 100 CVs to go through, and yours is like five pages, and you want me to read everything and interpret every details, I won't have that time. Whereas in this experience session, there are two things that are, there are like two to three things that are very important. You need to show that, okay, this particular position you want me to, these job descriptions that you, you listed, in your opening that you want me to be performing, like cleaning data, facilitating sprint meeting and all that. I've, I've, I've been doing it before. You need to show that in your CV. Whereas you need to even show that you are not someone that just does repetitive tasks. That you are someone that brings results to the table. You have to show what you have been able to achieve doing this. And that is where it's got to be. The, the third thing is that you have to show personality. The different when Miss Miss Oluwata was talking, she mentioned the human face and the technology face. Talking about ChatGPT and sometimes when you use it to write something, you still need it. You still need to proofread and re-edit and change a lot of things there. And that is the same thing that comes into being a tech professional. You cannot ignore the human aspect of it, because no matter how good you are, if you don't have a if you don't have good communication skill, you are going nowhere. And one thing is, one of those things that recruiters check, especially in other places, in outside Nigeria, is cultural fitness. You know, organizations are becoming very diverse now. So we need to know your ability to 
not that you are able to use Power BI or you are able to code, but you are able to fit into the culture of this organization. So, and that is where the soft skill came in. You have to demonstrate that on your CV as well. So, let's now get into it. What is the strategy? Most, most of the time, this session where we have our work experience, we used to have, okay, the, the first line, on the, the edge of the line, you have the position. You might choose to break it into the second line to have the name of the organization and the time frame we are there from 2021 to, let's say, 2023. You have that at the top. The next thing is, the best thing to do, which is which I encourage you to do, is the next thing is to briefly in one paragraph summarize your job description. You can always say, okay, a data analyst is responsible for gathering data, collecting data, visualizing data, and presenting results to management for consideration. This is something that depends on, you know, a data analyst in a retail organization where you deal with, let's say, where we have many people coming in, it's not going to be the same with a tech company that deals that have very, like, let's say, five tech clients. So the, the nature of data you are going to be working with in every organization differs. And that is where sometimes the, the job description will not say two years experience as a data analyst. They will state it that two years experience as a data analyst, they will state the, the nature of the data analyst role you are occupying or you want to occupy. And this is something you have to show in your first summary. Having done this, your bullet, your bullet point, you can have up to, let's say from three to five, it's okay. Because you need to keep your, the shorter your CV, the better it is. It's, so your ability to have a lot of information in the space of one or two pages is what makes it a solid CV. So, what are we now going to do? Instead of saying, I've been, I've been responsible for doing this, doing that, doing that. Just think, well, how is this particular role you're doing? And that is why the difference between work and job, between work and profession, is the fact that instead of you have to, you need to have the end in mind. Know that the, pro the purpose of this thing I'm doing is to achieve this result. So that result attainment should be something that motivates you. So having know the result of the achievement, be able to know this particular data that I'm claiming. What is it going to be used for? How is it going to, what result is it going to generate? So, having know that, that result is all what came best. Okay, improve the efficiency, improve productivity by doing this, by doing that. So, what the result of your effort be leading to? So, in that process, you've been able to tell us the results you achieve and what you do to achieve that result. So, that is what we do and, like we all know, I have seen, I have seen a couple of CV where they start the job experience, the job experience session from the first role in 2001, and then and towards the end of the fourth page, I'm seeing 2022 to present. That is not a good thing to do. And even if you have more than 10 years experience, it is better to just cover the last 10 years and leave the rest as early career. Those I like them that have read this role, have read this role. So, because I don't know if I'm going to be making a decision about you. I, I, I might not, it, it is very easy for me to go back to 10 years to make my decision for you. The next important session is the skill session. This session is particular, through your experience, a, a recruiter will see your skills, the skills that you have. They are going to see your accomplishment and see your soft skills through your experience session, you know, if well written. But the, the skill session is there specifically to cover things you don't cover. And why, you, why do you have to cover the skills that does not naturally reflect in your work experience session? Why do you have to cover it? Because of ATS. ATS work like SEO, and it is very important that for SEO, what, if, I, if you are searching for something on Google now, Google did not have any standard. It will just go online and search for that particular word you type, where did they have it? For every role, for every AT, ATS machine, it is processed it is program according to the job description you are applying for. So your ability to identify the key important component of that job description and have it on your CV is what makes you beat the system while remaining natural and believable. So the next thing is the education. Of course, they are asking you that you should have a background in social so course. So definitely your, your education is part of what they want to 
what they need in the person that is going to fill that role, so you can only do it. it. And an important part that I must talk about specifically, though it's part of the basic session, is the portfolio. Being tech professionals, one of those things in tech, I cannot just come here and tell you that I'm a software engineer and start telling you I'm a software engineer. The next thing you are going to ask is that, can I see your portfolio? Can I see some of the work you've done? And sometimes CV don't even come into the picture like portfolio. But whereas portfolio itself is a, is a, is a branding material, the same way CV is. So what are the, the things you, don't, you do and that you don't do in a CV? So what are the things, sorry, I have to be very fast and so that I can round up very quickly. So what are the things you do and that you don't do in a CV? The first thing that I've noticed virtually everyone is guilty of is using one CV to apply for 1,000 routes. It doesn't work that way. So imagine the governor wrote a letter to you and another one come from, let's say, a king from somewhere, and you are now drafting the same response. The response you used to respond to a king, you are now sending it to the governor. Even if it is by changing your ex your highness to your excellency, it's enough change that you have to make. So you don't use a single CV. But one thing you have to have, you, have to, you need to have a CV that serves as a baseline, a strong one. But for every role you have to apply for, you have to have a CV that aligns with what they want, that, that speaks the language they want to hear. That is very important thing. Another thing is there is no there is no there is no point having a CV as long as 24 pages. If you can keep it in one page, it's good. But two pages is the is the industry standard. A lot of people criticize, criticize the one page, but I think everybody can agree with the two page CV. Another thing you don't do is by all means, by all means, avoid making grammatical errors. They don't want to, they don't care if you study English in school or if you are a student of literature or whatever. They just want to, every, what everyone wants to see in a CV is perfection. Because it also communicates something that you can pay attention to the details. Not that you are not good in English or something, but that you can pay attention to details, which is very, very important in whatever it is. There are so, there are so many things I would like to say, but then, you can always, we, we have a, with Slam Be Pride, we have, a, we have a, a service that allows you to enroll for our career coaching services. Where, where, instead of me, us addressing you as a general audience, you are going to be, your CV, what you have, what you've been doing before, before attending the training and transition into, and that is one of the reasons why you should choose Learn With Pride. Because it is not, it doesn't stop about learning this, it doesn't stop when we stop when you complete the training. It even goes further to cover what you do after completing the training. Ensuring that you transition successfully from wherever, whatever it is that you are coming from into tech. While even checking your career trajectory so far and aligning it to make sure it there's alignment between where you are coming from and where you are going into. Thank you. I do enjoy the rest of the Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.